Hello friends, how are you? I didn't tell you that I watched a movie before and that I will do a detailed review. First of all, let me say that the movie was below my expectations, but this does not mean that I did not like the movie badly. Let's start then. Although this production, which is James Gunn's last project in Marvel, is an end for James Gunn and the old team, it faked us in many places. Every time, when we say ah, he's dead now, he's going to die, the fact that no one from the team died is entirely based on James Gunn's deception. Because Dave Bautista, who plays Drax, announced that he would be Drax for the last time in this movie, everyone was waiting for him to die. I knew that Rocket would not die, but the probability of everyone else dying was so high that the production was full of fake progress, not reverse corners. Since everything takes place in the continuation of the previous films, we see that the protectors still cannot recover themselves in the endgame and after. More precisely, although most of the people except Peter have returned to their old ways, Peter still hasn't been able to overcome some things and has given himself to alcohol. Our friend, whose mother was killed in vain by his father Ego, and kidnapped by looters at the age of eight, lost Gamora in the movie Infinity War. In the endgame, the brutal Gamora of the past, who has never met Peter before, has arrived in 2023. I have told you before that Gamora is the most cruel person among Nebula and Gamora, and they confirm this with this movie. Gamora is a really cruel person and believe me, the Nebula they call sadistic was deteriorated just because of the pain he experienced. The events begin with the involvement of Adam Warlock at the beginning of the movie. And for just the beginning of the movie, I think they make a very surprising start. We got to know the people of Sovarain in the second movie of Guardians of the Galaxy, and they hired our crew to guard against monsters that eat Kornix batteries. Of course, at that time, we did not know that this breed was created by the High Evolutionary. However, I have already explained to you that Adam Warlock was developed by High Evolutionary. In this movie, however, we see that Aisha is scolded for not sharing it with her creator, even though she knows about the existence of Rocket Raccoon, and even her species is in danger of being destroyed. The event is very simple. Although High Evolutionary is depicted as a god here, it is actually possible to make an inference about what he experienced throughout the movie. According to his belief, the supreme life form is himself. And so it's actually an insult to him that his own creation rocket sees things he can't, and achieves more than he thinks. If a serious psychological diagnosis is to be made in this film, I think the High Evolutionist's aim was not simply to create a master race. Because if that was his goal, then he wouldn't be spending all his resources on the most successful thing he's ever created. Especially wanting to examine his brain structure was the only way to make up for the defect he saw in himself. In addition, while his latest genres had a rote mentality, Rocket was not a rote person, he could really catch small details and make serious inferences. In fact, if it wasn't for him in the prison break scene in the first movie, probably no one would have gotten out. Therefore, High Evolutionary went after Rocket, risking to lose everything. In the movie, we watched one of the most insane villains in the Marvel Universe. As a result of this obsession of the High Evolutionist, he also decided one day to end the Sovarain people, probably the most superior race he ever created. That's why the Man Warlock was awakened early and fought for his people. Now we know why he's called Adam, so what does Warlock mean? In the comics, he was in a cocoon during the rebirth of Adam Warlock. High Evolutionary developed it and evolved it by placing the Soul Stone on his forehead. He later brought Adam Warlock to Counter-Earth, which would become a utopian society created by High Evolutionary. However, this plan failed and the evil entity named Man-Beast broke the whole order. Man-Beast was a human and animal-like alien created by the High Evolutionary and his only purpose was to invade the world with the army he gathered in Counter-Earth. We did not see such an incident in the movie, but the man was tasking the warlock to stop them and this was preventing the raid. Even though the man was a warlock boy, he was really strong, even Yandu's arrow couldn't pierce his skin. Besides, if the stone on his forehead had indeed been a soul stone, then things might have been different. In my own opinion, while the higher evolutionist was developing it, the celestial being may have used one of his eggs and fed it with cosmic energy. Because the celestial beings were distributing these eggs to almost every planet, this would explain why the man warlock's cosmic powers were so great. I think the first battle scene was good, it can't be said that the man warlock fought badly for a big baby. However, it was truly cruel for him to seriously injure the rocket in a single shot, and use it in the first fight and go through walls. 
The character we call Rocket is a tiny raccoon, so after killing him, what's the point of finding him? We knew that Rocket wasn't going to die in the scene where he was badly injured, but on this occasion, it was good that they occasionally showed the character's past. In other words, I think it was best to show the necessary scenes according to the progress of the movie, instead of an accelerated transition in one go. Well, of course, the fact that the rocket was made by High Evolutionary showed that it was also a product. Because rocket is a cybernetic life form, it is impossible to treat like ordinary creatures. Therefore, they need to find its creator and prevent it from self-destructing by entering the code. The whole adventure is based on this story. In my opinion, the real study should begin with a higher evolutionist. In the final battle of the movie, after seeing Nowhere, he referred to her as the dead godhead. Obviously, the higher evolutionist knows about the celestial beings and thinks that they are the true creators. But right after, he says, there is no god, so I didn't step in? Now is there a contradiction here? Or is what is meant to be told different? Does the higher evolutionist see himself as a celestial being? He creates civilizations, but does not wait for them to evolve like celestial beings, he cultivates them directly. And when he has the chance to create better ones, he kills his old creations. In this case, Rocket is a flawed creature created by him, but when he seems to have more than that, he constantly becomes obsessed with it. The higher evolutionist was described as the being that gave rise to many species in the universe. However, he never had full power to create, that a tribute was the power of celestial beings. The efforts of the high evolutionist, who hate everything as they are, actually seem pointless at some point. For example, millions of years of evolution of a panda become a human-shaped panda? I think they deliberately planned the aggressive turtle they used in the first experiment against Rocket to look like ninja turtles. I think what they're doing here isn't evolution, but instead they're using a mutation that makes animals look like humans. Coming to the end of High Evolutionary, of course, he may not be dead. After the mask on his face falls off, he can continue with his plans by wearing a helmet, just like in the comics. Marvel movie writers had an explanation, they said that if you didn't see them kill a character, you shouldn't think he might be dead. Of course, even if the higher evolutionist returns from now on, what can he do? Will it cause trouble for the team again? We don't know these yet. We also see a new team of looters in the movie, and Gamora has joined them. In fact, the looters became Gamora's family, and the Guardians of the Galaxy mean nothing to her. Among the looters, you may have seen Krugar, who opened portals like Doctor Strange. Now let's come to that scene in the movie that I don't understand. In that scene where Nebula, Mantis and Drax are left outside the ship and nearly freeze to death, it was Drax who broke the door. However, Nebula's arm had the power to pierce even the man warlock, and even to pierce a huge platform. Why didn't he use his Nebula arm while waiting outside to die for minutes? I don't understand this. The view they see when they enter is nothing but the captive image of hundreds of children. We'll see one of these kids join the Guardians of the Galaxy on the post credit scene. Always happy children who can work for hours with very little sleep. Phyla Vell is a character who can also have a connection with Captain Marvel. I'm not sure if it connects with Marvel's movie, because the origin story is handled differently here. We know that Rocket hasn't admitted to being a raccoon for years. At the beginning of the movie, he didn't agree when the Star-Lord called him a raccoon, nor did he agree when he met Lila in the astral dimension. But when he finally learned of his own kind, he adopted the name Rocket Raccoon. In the first movie, we saw that Lila was among Rocket's partners. But in this movie, we learn that Lila never managed to escape, and she died before she could see the sky. So how did this happen? If they were never partners, then why was Lila listed among Rocket's partners? These are just some of the details left in the air. We also see two different forms of Groot in the movie. He used the first of them as a deterrent force as Alpha Groot in the counter-Earth scene. He uses the other as King Groot in the movie's mid credit scene. It was also a legendary detail that the Star-Lord kept the weapons and his own weapons inside and scanned them. They're officially using the Groot as a gear bag. Also Groot surprises us by saying I love guys at the end. It was also funny that Gamora didn't understand Groot throughout the movie and said that you are making up what he said. In the movie, we get to know Cosmo, who was sent into space during the Soviet era. Our friend, who was once in the hands of the Collector, is currently hanging around on nowhere. Cosmo's telekinetic ability will also evolve over time and it seems adequate even now. Kraglin, played by Sean Gunn, 
the brother of James Gunn, finally manages to use Yandu's collar arrow. Just as Yandu told Quill, Yandu's astral image in this movie gives advice to help the Kraglin use the arrow. With this movie, everyone has started to think that Drax is an idiot. Drax who used to treat Mantis as a fool is now treated like a fool by the Mantis he used to treat as a fool. In addition, our friend, who was sad to lose his daughter and wife in the first movie, reminded us of the scene where he sacrificed himself to save Gamora in the first movie, where he is now about to freeze to death in space. When Peter's mouth swelled up, I said ah, he dies for sure now, but he was saved by Adam Warlock. Gamora nevertheless admitted that she had fun with Peter, but because she saw the looters as her family, she left him and went back to her family. Peter, on the other hand, returned to his grandfather, whom he left on Earth years ago. Actually, it was better that he left the team, because it would have been better to see Peter in the Avengers instead of the Guardians of the Galaxy. One of the biggest shortcomings in this movie was the lack of jetpacks that made Star-Lord a Star-Lord. Seriously, I thought for a long time why they didn't add this, in fact, the biggest life-saving element in this movie could be the Star-Lord's jetpacks. Coming to the mid credit scene, we now see the Guardians of the New Galaxy led by Rocket. Adam Warlock, Kraglin, Groot, Cosmo, Falavel and Rocket. The music that Rocket opens with the Star-Lord's music box is a reference to the adventure that started with Star-Lord stealing the Power Stone from Morag in the first movie. So the Guardians of the Galaxy still continue. In the post credit scene, we see Peter and his grandfather talking. In the newspaper that his grandfather read, we see that Kevin Bacon has been kidnapped. This is a reference to the movie Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special. Finally, it says that the legendary Star-Lord will return. Legendary Star-Lord, actually we are the name of the comic book number, and that means we will see the Star-Lord again, either in a solo movie or in another character movie. My guess is to see it in the upcoming Avengers, but I would also like to have Thor and the two go on joint adventures. If you haven't subscribed to the channel this much than me for now, don't forget to subscribe and like, see you in other videos.